this video was originally recorded November 2020 at Menla Retreat and Dewa Spa in Venetia, New York. Alright, greetings everyone. I'm very happy to be back at Menla, in this case, rather than my home studio. Um, I haven't been doing personal podcasts, like new fresh material, about the situation in the world in the moment. I haven't been doing them for a while because of the COVID. My engineer and I have been both home secluded. And so, and I haven't, we haven't figured out how to do it on, on Zoom, although I think I might do that. But anyway, today somehow I cleared the time and I decided I would do a podcast, a personal one, about everything that's going on. Because after all, we really do need to catch up a little bit in regard to sort of the type of thing I used to do when I would travel the country, um, doing book tours and lecture tours, this sort of thing, where I had a, a, a lecture that I used to give everywhere, which was called Buddhist Ethics and the World Crisis. So it gave me kind of an excuse to um, talk about the Dharma in a way, but talk about it in terms of contemporary affairs. And uh, once uh, one of my most favorite things that I did was in Mississippi, in Oxford, Mississippi, at the University of Mississippi. I did that, which is a sort of sentimental place for me, indirectly, because several generations ago I had family in that area. I had a famous novelist in the South called Stark Young, who was a cousin, and then people even in the Faulkner family and others, you know, although I always used to jokingly think that um, Yakna Patofa County, which was uh, Faulkner's mythical county where he had Benjamin the Idiot, <laughs> that was probably my family. <laughs> because, you know, I don't really too much identify, actually, with my wasp family uh, from two directions, you know. I had one one side, my father's side were southerners, and my mother's side were northerners. So we spanned the sort of terrible, racist, you know, civil war battle from both directions. Mother's side were abolitionists, father's side they were plantation owners. And um, But I don't really identify with them, not really only out of neurosis. I may, maybe it's an element of neuro neurosis, somebody might like to say, and I wouldn't deny it. But uh, mainly because in the Tibetan practice, because of the theory, the biological theory of karma, you don't really that much identify with your blood and bone ancestors, you know, the white, the red and white ancestors, the mother, the red one from the mother, the white one from the father. You don't so much identify with them, rather you identify with your Dharma ancestors, your spiritual ones. And you know, you have, they have rituals and meditations and ceremonies where you actually kind of replace your DNA with um, Dharma DNA, you know, rather than blood and bone DNA. And you don't know that you have bone DNA, but you don't really do ancestors. Now, other Buddhist nations do, or where Buddhism was in Asia, they still have some, retain some notion of the ancestors. And, uh, for example, Zen centers in Japan are pretty much funeral parlors, um, and they have big cemeteries associated with them often, and probably in China and Korea as well. And um, Pignat Han was very big on you have to appreciate your ancestors. And so, fine, we do that, but in a way, all beings are your ancestors when you really get into karma. And you really do see yourself as all beings are my mother. You do meditate that. And you do sort of diffuse the sense of kinship identification to spread it throughout all beings, you know. And actually it's a deep anti-racist thing. It's very, it could be very important to develop such meditations. And then in Tantra especially, you have a thing where you make offerings to, of your own substance, in a way. You have a, a skull cup, and then you visualize that your own meat and blood, flesh and blood is in the skull cup. And you, you don't actually you do that, but you visualize that, you imagine that. And then you offer from that to your spiritual ancestors. And so, in a way, you're offering your blood and bone lineage 
to your spiritual lineage and you identify with your spiritual lineage. And, um, you know, that's why I like to say, for example, we have to change the senses and we don't have white anymore. We have to really to get rid of one thing that will be one step towards eliminating white supremacy is getting rid of the category of white because we're not white. We're pink. The, the people who are called Caucasian or white or whatever they get into about it, which seems to be a flexible category. I was shocked a few years ago when I started reading in that, maybe a few decades ago, actually, when I started reading in that, and I heard that the Irish were not considered white for a long time, and the Italians and so on. And that's just the silliest thing, because the only people who are white are some clown who paints their face white, you know. Other people who are considered Caucasian are actually pink, and they're all in search of a tan, or at least they used to be before the, the ozone layer was depleted and they got worried about ultraviolet light creating skin, skin cancer. Otherwise, it was pink people in quest of a tan, and we don't need such a long thing, we just call it pink. So you have pink, black, yellow, red, and... Um, there must be green, unless they are the race of dolphins. I don't know which the green people are. But in ancient times, you had some green people. So, okay. So I want to talk about contemporary situation. And uh, I haven't been doing this with you lately. And I apologize. But uh, now we're going to my engineer, Justin, is here. And we're working on this. And we're just doing it with an iPhone. with no fancy lighting and fancy microphones and all this. And... Um, I'm going to start doing some book. I've had people waiting to do book uh, events to try to market books because uh, there's no way of doing book tours or bookstore things now since the, since the bad administration has been uh, wrecking us and killing us with COVID. So that's the first place to start. One thing that's really been on my mind that the media has not made enough of a fuss about, and I'm kind of bugged with them for that reason, is the you know Taiwan, New Zealand have had very little death and very little infection. China wiped out the infection very quickly after a terrible initial burst of it. And how did they do that? They didn't have a vaccine. So since Trump started trying to spread blame away from himself and refused to take responsibility for the really disastrous level of COVID death and COVID infection that we've had here, and particularly affecting people of color, um, by rapping about Operation Warp Speed, and we're gonna have a vaccine, and all this, and only vaccine will do the job. Somehow the media also got into the vaccine, when we get the vaccine, and even practically the incoming uh, administration of Biden, they're talking about we wanna help manage the vaccine. But the point is, what they did was they refused to do proper federal control of COVID from the beginning. And they did it for purely two levels of selfish reasons, it seems. There is a Vanity Fair expose article that came out finally recently about a group of industrialists and creative internet people and so on, who went, who made a plan and trooped to the White House to present the plan and requested the administration to do the defense Emergency Production Authorization Act, you know, demand on their companies to produce plenty of PPE in the United States, plenty of testing equipment and also chemicals and also set up more labs everywhere. So there could have been massive testing from the beginning. And then the computer people came and said, we can do contact tracing through people's iPhones and, you know, um, you know, um, not only iPhones, but a Android phones and iPhones, uh, right away. And this was in March of this last year when things were taking off in the bad direction. And guess what? Mr. Kushner, supposed absolute flub failure like his uncle, like his father-in-law, he said, no, we don't want to do that. We're not doing that. We, we let the market take care of things. And also we want to let the states manage. And they have to do it. Of course, they don't have a defense emergency production authorization facility. They can't order companies to produce things. He knew that. And then he said, we're going to let it go. And then we'll blame the states. And then because of those big states are all those democratic states, you know, that we, they didn't vote for us. So we're going to blame the states. 
and then we're going to somehow come out of it, you know, and then we'll take credit, federals, or we'll come out of it with a vaccine or with something at some stage after having blamed the states of mismanagement. And then he, did, he basically confessed right away to that group, but not completely bluntly, as bluntly as I'm expressing it, that they were going to use the thing to try to win re-election and to do, do in the, the democratic people. That is treason, actually, like everything else they have done. We have to face the fact media will not call them traitors, but they are actually, you know, the, the, the Drumpf family, especially him, and then his in-laws, they are basically Benedict Arnold's is the trope that has to get out into the public. They are traitors, they are treasonous. They have allied themselves with every enemy that the U.S. has had in the last 50, 100, or 200 years. They've allied themselves with Johnny Rebs, the people who betrayed the Union to keep their slaves, who were trying to take over the Union with their slaves. And then when the when Lincoln stood up against them and the new Republican Party was formed as a radical party at the time, had Lincoln at the head and won the 1860 election, they split off and people like Jefferson Davis and um, uh, Robert E. Lee broke their vows to the Union that they took at West Point and pretended that, you know, the, I have a higher homeland, which is the South, rather than the Union. And it's the slaveholders and slave owning and the slave economy that I have a higher duty to. And I was so pleased with General McChrystal. You know, I'm a Buddhist and really I shouldn't admire super killer generals, but in a way, I liked them. You know, I had a lot of them in my family, actually, in the past, the Thurman generals and lots of others on both sides of different wars. And, uh, but anyway, this is just that. I don't really like war markers. I think there's a bigger war to be achieved by conquering your own inner enemy that I, I really am converted in that direction. And, uh, but I do admire that he, he wrote an op-ed that I read not so long ago where he said, he suddenly realized, I guess he retired after Obama fired him for talking trash in his court, in his group of, 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 of uh, adjutants and aides. He was talking trash about Obama being wimpy, but Obama was wimpy. He was not a good wartime president. Like imagine, we're gonna go into Afghanistan, but we're gonna leave in six months, however we do. And the enemy just waits, you know, when they hear that. And the enemy, of course, which nobody's really admitted except Admiral McMullen admitted it, and then he pretended they didn't. But he admitted in testimony to the Congress that the real enemy were the Pakistanis in Afghanistan. They were, the, the, you know, the Taliban are really supported by the Pakistanis. And we were meanwhile driving supply trucks through the enemy territory, therefore, and paying huge bribes. And for a while, the Russians let us go through their territory with airplanes and using airports. But basically, we were, you know, we were naturally going to fail there because we were fighting the wrong enemy. There was not, the Afghanis were not really our enemy. But that's another story, you know. And now, of course, the current administration, by pretending not to admit that they've been voted out, they're planting booby traps by trying to bail from Afghanistan and let the Taliban take over right away in their violent manner, which is a complete atrocity. We can't do that. You know, we have to do a whole new diplomacy and a whole new arrangement in pa with Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, before we can actually leave. We have responsibilities to do that. And, and the new administration will have to deal with it, you know. And, and he knows that, Trump, and so he's trying to make it bad, worse for them before he leaves. It's really quite treason, another kind of treason that he's doing. So anyway, he joined the civil war against the Union basically by saying fine, very fine people on both sides and inciting the Proud Boys and inciting the, the white supremacy violence and refusing to condemn David Duke and these kind of people, you know, accepting their support happily. And then second, he is a Nazi. His father was a Nazi, member, card-carrying member of the Nazi party. And he grew up with Mein Kampf as an honored book in the house, although they don't admit it, but he did. And he is a Nazi, basically. He wants to be a dictator. He, he admires Hitler secretly.
for sure. He certainly admires any living dictators, Putin, uh, Kim Jong-un, Duterte, uh, anyone in Africa that he can find. He loves the dictators, that they're his, uh, his cup of tea. And he openly said, 12 more years, 16 more years, I'd like to be president for life. Xi Jinping did that. I then went, Xi Jinping claimed he was not going to be term limited to two terms. In China, he, Trump said he wanted to be like that. So he, that's, so that's the second treason. So civil war, white racist supremacist, a slave, slaver, then, um, uh, 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 Nazi. We had a World War II to control the Nazis. And third, he's a flunky of Putin's. He does what Putin tells him. Everything he's done has benefited Putin. He's only frustrated, as is Putin, that he was not able to break, make the Congress fit push the Congress around enough. He did push the lackey, treasonous Republicans like Lindsey Graham and McConnell, who are also sold out to the Russians, but he pushed them, but he wasn't able to push the whole Congress enough to remove all the sanctions from Putin for the invasion of Ukraine and the grabbing of Crimea and all this, and the invasion of Syria, actually, and the destruction of Syria. Terrible things that have gone on in his watch. In other words, we have to admit that our democracy is so imperfect and it was so much relying on quote unquote people of goodwill and therefore we were not facing the fact that since Reagan, or really since Goldwater, right, and Nixon, but, but actually in power since Reagan, we have uh, allowed people who refuse to serve as a loyal opposition to take power. And then when they're occasionally losing power in some place, because they're not a loyal opposition, they simply block the governing. And they use the excuse that the government is the problem, which was Reagan's very slogan, you know. Worst thing you can hear is someone saying, I here I am, I'm, for, I'm from the government, I want to help. Meaning that's a harm. And that's a fascism, you understand? You have to, we have to understand that clearly. Mussolini defined fascism as when the government and the corporate powers, the wealthy oligarchic industrialists in any country, unify by the corporate moneyed people, oligarchy taking over the government, then the people have no defense. The only institution that can possibly defend the people is the family. And you know, if the family is a large extended family, maybe they have a little local strength. But basically, they can never stand up against an organized government and, and the corporate, you know, um, mercantile class re, re, through the corporate power. It's impossible. So then you have fascism. And then fascism is, and then the key about fascism is, contrary to the false policy and false theories of Lee Kuan Yew, who has been the dictator family of Singapore for the last 40, since, since liberation from colonialism, they replaced colonialism by a dictator, really basically a dictatorship of a family, but semi-benevolent in a small place and using their role as finance, with finance to enrich their people and pay them off enough to and educate them well enough. So it's kind of benevolent dictatorship, but it is dictatorship. But anyway, they made a theory that dictatorship is more efficient in industrial society, and this is false. In fact, every time the 1920s, when a strong oligarchy took control of the U.S. government, they created the Depression. When, since Reagan, since 1974, there's a wonderful thing, I was very pleased to see it. There's a group online called The Medium, and there's a great writer who writes in them called, two of them, one is called Laura Martincheck, and the other one is called Umair Hak, Haku or Hak, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. But they write very critically and well, and they acknowledge themselves as leftists, which I think is a silly term. But the point is, they are facing the radical problem we face now to try to restore the good strand that does run through our American democratic experiment, even though it was started by a bunch of white oligarchs, a bunch of pink, rather, oligarchs, who had the land and the, and the, you know, and the slaves, actually, most of them, and they, they, um, they wanted democracy among themselves, just like Athenian democracy that we point to, 
the, 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 the pinks who were the males who ran Athenian democracy, the democracy was actually a way for the warrior elite not to fight internally so they could have a power as a community. But they were not liberating their slaves and things. But however, our American democracy, because of the idealism of people like Adams and Madison and Jefferson and Hamilton, they have, we have a vein in that, because I think they were reincarnations of bodhisattvas, those particular people, where <clears throat> they put in seeds, all men are created equal, that would lead eventually to the abolition of slavery, even though that took a war because people were so financially dedicated to it, the suffrage of women, and, uh, you know, the general, the, in a way, not to be foreign entanglement, not to, to rebel against empire, the British empire. So it's that strand of liberation, independence, freedom seeking, pursuit of happiness, rather than pursuit of property, that is there, although that strand in the Declaration was, of course, undermined in some extent by many of the provisions in the Constitution, where the slave owners and the elite wanted to secure their properties and didn't want to share it widely with people. So we've always had a tug of war, and we're totally in ignorance and neglect of our debt to the Native American people, and their still continuing presence and our continuing need for them, actually. So now we are... Now we are at a new moment where we have people from the side of the bright line that runs through our American experiment that if we follow could lead us to true democracy and a truly effective society and, and why we are beloved in the world is for our Michael Jacksons, you know, and for our creativity and our, the blues singers, you know, and the American culture that the black people have created, you know, and um, and also the native people and the romance of the, you know, crazy horse and stuff like this. That our culture is a mixed culture like that. It's not just a pink culture from Europe. And also even the guy who was president of Yale in the late 18th century, he said, when America will really come into its own is when our legacy from Asia, of course, the Pacific equals our legacy from the Atlantic. So we're kind of this new place that all these things can be mixed. And uh, it's not like we're the only melting pot. Actually, the great ancient melting pot was India, in fact. And every place has been a bit of a melting pot, but India was the really biggest one in the world. And we have the second one, which is needed in the world, so we can have a global, democratic, environmentally sound, sustainable, cheerful society where there's enough for everyone. And yet there, and yet there, there's an ability for some to rise and to do creativity and to tap the creativity of the human being, which we have a tremendous creativity and to live in freedom. This is our mission of America. That is the mission of America. That is our exceptionalism in our effort to do that. And there is that exceptionalist strain in every culture, actually. And it's up to us to find it, not to dominate them and force them to try to enter our pattern. That, that's imperialism. And that's, that's, we don't, we're not exceptional as imperialists. Everybody has their own tribal behavior. You know, we're not the only one. Our pinkies are not the only one. <laughs> Pink supremacy. I love it. I really think it's great. We really have to think of that. It's pink and black and yellow and red in, on this continent. That's what it is. Not white. All right. Okay. So now, what do we do? How do we execute this issue? What do we do about it? You know, reparation, one thing. We have to do some reparations. Now, if we try to all the way go right away to reparations, we might, in a way, because of the ineffectiveness of the oligarchic rule that we've been suffering since Reagan, the weakness of the government and the oligarchic rule and the oligarchic capture of the government, people like McConnell and Graham and other evil types like that. Because of that, we don't have the means maybe to do the full reparation that we should do right away. But here's how do we guarantee it? I have a very good method. We did build a wonderful museum, of uh, African-American museum, and we built a Native American museum in Washington. 
okay, in our sort of central mandala there. But what those museums don't have is they don't have a big lobbying organization attached to them, which they should have. They don't have to be in the same building. I don't know the, I don't know the architecture of the room. But if we devoted a paltry 20, 30 billion to create an African-American lobbying uh, society or institution right in Washington that would compete with other lobbying things, and we did another 20 billion for Native American people, where they could actually be take their educated people, their lawyers, their knowledgeable people, their people who know corporate behavior, and they would be paralleling and lobbying for general bills and long-term programs. And also they could uh, do like Common Cause, you know, Citizens United, not Citizens United, that's the evil one, but there's a citizen something. There's, there's a bunch of things like that. You know, the AARP for old people. Why don't we have one like that for black people? And why don't we have one like that for Native American people? And why don't we have one like that for Asian American people? And why don't we have one like that for Muslim American people if we think, if they, they, we feel they need it? I don't know how many there are. But the point is, this can all be logically organized. So these oppressed minorities, you know, certainly we should have a major immigration thing. And you know, those guys, how many trillion did they do in hopes of getting reelected? They allowed to happen. The treasonous government that we've had, the head treasonous government that we had, how many trillions did they send out in, in paltry $1,200 checks? Meanwhile, another way they sent big checks to the airlines and to their oligarchic pals, like billions they gave. Just right away, just the debt money. They just took it, printed it, okay? How much did they do? So what's 20, 30 billion for a lobbying organization? It's very small, it's easy to do. Even 50 billion, I don't care. And then some of it they could actually start, you know, 40 acres on a mule, they could calculate what 40 acres would be worth now before the, they undid the post-Civil War enfranchisement of the blacks. And Jim Crow said it, you know. That should, they should go back and un-Jim Crow, totally everything. Then. How many billion would you need to liberate every single nonviolent black man in jail for drug offenses and get them out and really rehabilitate them fully and expunge their records and, um, and pay for them for whatever schooling they need, whatever investment they need to start small businesses or whatever it is and get, get the advantage of their wonderful creativity and energy as fully prepared. How many billions would it take to reestablish the police academies where the Ku Klux Klan members and the John Birch Society members would not be able to join without undergoing a sort of re-education? I think, what, what is this bad policing and this killing of uh, people of color? It's simply because, which is obvious, if you're a Ku Klux Klan person, if you're a John Birch Society person, you know, you want to arm yourself and you want to oppress your, your neighbors of other races and immigrants and people. Obviously, the thing to do is ha be able to legally run around with your gun. And the way to do that is just go to police school. And if enough of you go, you can wink and nod at each other in the locker rooms about how you're going to use your authority as a policeman. I mean, that's uh, obvious. And what sort of education otherwise does it take to educate a policeman? How come they don't work on, how come they don't work on their anti-racism? How come they're not encouraged to meditate on old beings or their mothers? And speaking of mothers, how about women? Ooh, ERA, let's have, let's, how many billions would it take to lobby to have them enfranchised where they get equal pay for equal work? That was never, the, and, and no Phyllis Schlafly can possibly under, undo a well-funded huge program to equalize women 100%. And forget this crap about, oh, gee whiz, Kamala's vice president now, or Sarah Palin, or, and Hillary's a witch, we want to burn her at the stake because she's a cannibal who eats children. I mean, what kind of ridiculous nonsense was that? That that was allowed to proliferate. And then, of course, that brings us to a major thing we have to do in order to get any of this done. And that is, we have to shut down the Fox News, Breitbart, Newsmax, Whatever they are, the media, and we have to reinterpret the freedom of speech amendment very carefully. 
that speech that incites to violence, that encodes racism and division, is not free speech. It is criminal speech. And we have to look at, we have to, we did have that. We had something that Reagan, again, destroyed, and it was called the Fairness Doctrine. And we can strengthen the Fairness Doctrine, and that is people are free to lie online. Yes, but then someone else in the same program has to say it's a lie, not fact check it in some abstruse place that major people will, will never look, who are brainwashed by that propaganda. We cannot have the power of modern media harnessed to propaganda. Okay? That's not, it's not free, that's not free speech. That's brainwashing. That's a licensing of brainwashing. And that's the, that solves the mystery of why are we so polarized? We're so polarized because people are so confused. Because they're propagandized. Okay? The left is true to some extent are propagandized. But uh, not to the degree of the oligarchic people who want to confuse people to vote against their self-interest, actually. That's the pink people have been doing, the poor pink people. Time-honored thing for the poor pink people is to make them think that the poor black people or the poor brown people or the poor immigrant people are ruining their lives. But meanwhile, their employers are ruining their lives. The oligarchy is for the ones who are ruining their lives. Coming back to that wonderful economic thing, if the distribution of wealth without any socialism, name of socialism rather, but in a way the New Deal of FTR has some aspects of socialism in that it has the theory that the community owes the individual in the community a right to free education, a right to free health care, a right to freedom of speech, a right to basic shelter, Destitution is not there to frighten the low, the low class, lower class people into subservience and enslavement by the upper class people. That use of, you know, in England they had debtor's prison, the enclosure of the commons, this sort of thing. They had this theory that, you know, God wanted you to slave, be a slave. And, and that's been an Indian caste system had that theory, and all caste systems have that theory. And that's not democratic, and that's not efficient, and it's not, it's not ethical. It, 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 it disgraces what a human being is, and it, dis, it disrespects the m evolutionary miracle of being human, which we cannot allow, and we cannot have a happy society that lives like that. So, they said, that because, maybe because of the war effort against the Nazis, we had allowed women to work in factories and blacks we had fought in the war. And so in a way we triumphed because of our democracy, because everybody, people, sort of quote unquote lowly people, had a stake in defending the society. Otherwise, why didn't they all become Nazis and let Hitler run things? What, 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 why fight them? Why do we do that? Just to have our own Hitler-type oligarchs on top of us, the Drumpf, put the Drumpf Nazi family in charge of America. Why didn't we do that in 1940, 1939? Why? Because we didn't want to live like that, that's why. And we, and we don't want to look like that. And again, look, Hitler was an oligarch and a, and a dictator, right? And what did he do to his people and his country? He destroyed them. And he destroyed the country in 13 years. From 32 to 45, he completely destroyed the country. That's the efficiency of dictators. <laughs> because, you know, people don't like to be dominated like that. And so the only way you can do it is to keep pretending that they have some other enemy somewhere, so you have to go fight people. So you have to mobilize your people for war all the time. Because you only have an excuse to be dictating because you're there on a war footing. And that's the age-old game of kings. It's in the game of thrones. It was kind of legitimated in our country even by the popularity of the game of thrones. That's a, that's a sucky thing, game of thrones. Terrible. It's an awful thing. You know, just showing everybody, enforcing everybody's cynicism, that everybody's out just for power, and then they're torturing people, and then sex is only a way of torture. And it's, and you know, nothing. It's horrible. 
that, that we love that. And people bailed when they saw the ending where they destroyed the one woman who might have been trying to liberate people and be nice, and then you can't add that. So it shows that the Game of Thrones was nothing but a rationale for our oligarchic control. So to come back to it, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, but you know, that's what I do. But anyway, they said the way that income was distributed from 45 to 75, or 74 or 5, approximately, if that had continued from 75 to now, the $54 trillion, that's $2.8 trillion a year or something, it's 2 point something, 2.54, 2.73, I don't know exactly what, but almost $3 trillion every year was displaced from wage earners to stock owners to bosses, you know, to corporate bosses, stockholders, shareholders, okay? So, so that means that p the masses of our country were, have been impoverished over the, since, really, it's really Reagan who did, really did it, but Carter was trying to stop it, but he couldn't stop it, and so it started toward the end of Nixon, Ford. And then Carter was tried to stop it, but he couldn't. Because they started their lack of loyal opposition. Carter was defeated for his second term because the Reagan people promised the Iranians that they would give them free parts to their airplanes and would help them in their war effort against Saddam Hussein, who was our protege at that time, if they held the prisoners of the American embassy for a few weeks past the election. And then leaked the idea that they, they, they were going to be liberated just before the election, which would have been popularizing for Carter, and then on mo Monday morning before the Tuesday election, they said, no, they're keeping them, they're not liberating them, and then everybody was mad at Carter. And that tipped a scale for Reagan. You know? I know people who were in the campaign, and that was it. That was like Comey saying, Hillary Clinton, we have new emails, you know, just before that election. So that's, and, and those are acts where the person running for president, Nixon did the same thing. He went to South Vietnam and told the Jew, don't go to the Geneva Peace Conference that in 1967, that Johnson was trying to make peace so Hubert Humphrey would have a chance to win. And he went and he defeated the peace conference by preventing this, by telling the South Vietnamese he was going to bomb the shit out of North Korea and he would, they would end up conquering North Korea, which of course was a lie. And in fact, it ended up killing lots more people, lots more Americans, lots more Vietnamese. And it ended up ended up losing the entire country. So when you allow a criminal to run the country, which Nixon was, then did you get this kind of a disaster. Nixon was ejected, luckily, because at that time the Republicans hadn't sold out yet completely to the criminals. But they were on the brink of becoming a non-loyal opposition, which they then became from Reagan on. But they were going to dominate and have minority rule over the masses, and they were going to do that by brainwashing the masses to be confused as to who was the source of their discomfort. And they did it successfully. And Clinton sold out to them. He tried a little bit to oppose them, but then he failed. And Obama tried to oppose them and failed because they just ran it steadily for 40 years and deprived the American population of $54 trillion worth of livelihood which they pocketed themselves at their oligarchy, they handed to the oligarchy, the billion, multi-billionaires. And by doing that, created this unrest and civil disorder and near destruction of America, which the Trump administration has tried to complete, and still trying to complete, actually, the day that I'm telling this. I think they failed to put the coup de grace, and I think we will have a new administration now, but it's very close, just because we had one. We had a new administration with Obama. We had a new administration with Clinton. We had a new administration with Carter. And it's not a matter of Democratic versus Republican. It has nothing to do with that. It's those people who still think there is this bright thread running through America. And they don't see this. They don't see that Americans are unable to, con to deal with themselves and they need to be controlled by oligarchy, by minority rule, which is what Reagan was hired to propose by the oligarchs, okay? So 
this is this is the job. It, it is not the job that the conventional politics as usual Democrats are going to be able to do. They're not going to be able to do that. We need the more ones who are willing to not live in denial of the parlous, of the terrible state that the country has gotten into. We have to be able to face that. We have to realize that the so-called leftists are the ones who see it, the anti-racists, the leftists, the Black Lives Matter people. You know, they're, they're, they're the, the DACA immigrant people. But the, the conventional Democrats might do something decent. They didn't before. Obama was it. He deported tons of people and had a very nasty thing because he was sold out to the ideals. Even the Supreme Court has been packed against doing anything proper. So when they say, when they said before the election, are you going to pack the Supreme Court? It was a typical big lie technique. Meanwhile, they were packing the Supreme Court because this whole originalism of Scalia and now the majority on the Supreme Court, that's a fake thing. It's not the Constitution is not sacred in that sense. That we have a Constitution is sacred, but the Constitution is something that was created to be constantly amended in new circumstances. We're not going back to an 18th century slave owner Constitution, <laughs> although that's what their originalism proposes. We can't allow that. So we have to rebalance that majority on the Supreme Court. We have to introduce, for example, term limits on the Supreme Court. Lifetime terms are not doable. Any lifetime terms in any lower courts have to be reversed by legislation. And before that, so that legislation cannot be shot down under some fake doctrine of originalism. We have to put in four new justices who are sane and who realize we're in the 21st century. And they're not religious fanatics, and they don't think that the late 18th century was paradise. Okay? Little city of Puritans on a hill, committing genocide, enslaving blacks, committing genocide on Native Americans, suppressing the women, suppressing any gay or, you know, ho ho any, any kind of different kinds of erotic person, burning them at the stake, killing them, burning witches. We're not going back to that. We cannot allow that. So, it's really, there's a real job to be done. And the first place where we must do that job is in our own minds. We have to see clearly. We have to meditate, develop our mindfulness. You know, we don't have to be Buddhists. But far from it. No, the Dalai Lama, no, me, nobody wants everybody to be Buddhists. We don't want to make the fanatical Christians think that some fanatical Buddhists are hunting them or fanatical Muslims, or any fanatical Jews, or fanatical Hindu. No way. We want everyone to find a non-fanatical element in the wonderful teachings of love, wisdom, compassion, faith, humility, you know, ethics, that is in the center of all their religions. We want them to find that. Not to, not the idea that my, my faith is an identity card, that enables me then to kill anybody who doesn't have the same identity card. That's, that's not religion. That's some sort of fake subscription service. That's like a militancy thing that is not, not what they meant. They didn't say that. None of them. You know, Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He didn't order a bunch of anti-Semitic Christians to kill Jews. In no way did he ever do that. Jesus was a rabbi, and he wanted people to be truly faithful to Jehovah, who he thought of as his dad, God. Okay, so where does this anti-Semitism come from? That means that religions can be distorted, and therefore you have to understand the religion, and you have to, that we will do in education. That's where we want to educate people. We don't want them to be Buddhists. So be mindful. And when you look in your own mind, find in there what they have been inherited, where you've been propagandized. You know, do your own fact-checking in your mind and look at your underlying thoughts and re reactions. And don't give in and say, well, I'm automatically, because I'm pink, I'm automatically going to dislike anyone who's black or anybody who's yellow. And of course, they dislike me because I'm pink. Or they just like me because, you know, in other words, we're not going to settle for that. No. 
you look into your mind, you can find the sources of your prejudices, of your reactions, of your preconceived ideas and presuppositions. You can find that. Everyone has to find that, and you can, and you'll be free then. You'll be free in your mind. That's where you find freedom. You know, freedom, you know, they hate our freedom, W said, you know. Well, they don't hate your freedom. They all want to be free themselves. But they, if you find freedom, if you, if you have it in your mind, then you're going to be a sensible, kind, compassionate, friendly person. And humorous and amusing and wonderful. Actually, W is kind of a person like that. He just like, let himself be used as a tool by lesser people, unfortunately. He was a little simplistic in his uh, poorly educated in a way. Yale didn't do the trick for him. <laughs> and it's not his fault, you know. I know some cousins of his. I never met him. I know some cousins of his, and they say he was the most fun, friendliest guy. Of course, then they use people like that to put up as a front man, the oligarchs, you know. <clears throat> okay, so there we are. This is my podcast of the work we have to do. World peace to inner peace. Peace in America through your peace in your mind and my mind and friendliness and happiness. And we can do it. Remember Obama, how did he win so dramatically, even with everybody, the so-called famous Obama-Trump voters, people who'd been robbed by Obama's time, 2008, they had been robbed already for 28 years of trillions of dollars from their paychecks and, their, and poor infrastructure and bad health care and bad food, poison food that the uncontrolled food industry has been pumping out to people, poison drinks. Diabetes soft drinks, diabetes creating soft drinks are supposedly legal. Meanwhile, they couldn't smoke pot and they go to jail for it. Give me a break. They were arrested for Coke, which is how Coca-Cola got started. They had actually Coke, legal Coke in Coke until the 1990s. They had just, but not like highly purified, but just from leaves, Flu fluid from the leaves little coca juice to give you a little energy, like the Bolivians and the Peruvians in the high mountains use. Perfectly not that unhealthy, a little like stimulating, but not unhealthy. So we have to go back to that. We need the native people everywhere too. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to start doing some more regular ones. I'm going to do them. And uh, this is the first one in a new series now. And then I'm going to release an audible book of my Vimala Kirti commentary. Because in a way they're kind of along this vein, but more like just in kind of comment on the scripture, which is nice. And uh, then I'm going to do the, the Buddha Vatamsaka. I'm going to start doing that in the midst of everything. I am doing Vajra Yoga with those yogi and yoginis who want to do that and want to set up those kind of schools as a livelihood to give them teacher training. I am doing that. And um, for all of those reasons why I have been absent from from your my podcast list and just using old material, which is all useful and nice, but I want to, I want us to be, I want to be with you and I hope you are with us in this new job we have to to renew our country. You know, I have been haunted for the longest time by Edgar Casey, who I very much respect. And he did say, I heard, I haven't, I should really check, that someday in the future America would have a black president. And when we did, after that, that would be the end of America. And, you know, that was haunting me. And these people have been trying to destroy America, for sure. Or they want to create some sort of fascist, weird version of it, which is destroying it, you know. And, you know, so I think what he meant maybe was we need the old, the America before was the bright line through it was not strong enough. And the imperialist, the neo-imperialist line was also strong. My history teacher in high school used to talk about McKinley. Betraying the Filipinos was the start of this in a sort of geopolitical way where America stepped into being imperialist. And um, uh, he had an analysis like that. 
So we have to make America anew. That's what we have to do. And we have to, we have to realize we're facing a cold civil war, in which with a little burst of hot when some guy machine guns a bunch of kids at a rock concert or something. That's like a little heat of the cold civil war. It's where the pink people are trying to be white supremacists, futilely, but they will be very destructive. So we have to build the country anew where this one, this finally solve this problem. Okay? And be the true rainbow country and paint that White House with rainbow colors. We can't have a White House anymore. White House America is a slave only one, still in some level of the mentality. We have to have a rainbow house America. That's what we have to have. All right? Think of a rainbow house. Rainbow body, rainbow house. All right? All the best. By the virtue of this, may we all become truly genius intelligent as quickly as possible to help everybody else become genius intelligent to stop being confused by confused self-defeating people. Okay? As quickly as possible. That's the dedication. This online offering was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and viewers like you. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.